Hi, I'm Lucy Brogdon, Chair of the National Mental Health Commission Advisory Board. Welcome to this online conference. What an innovative approach to sharing knowledge and learnings right across the country. I understand there are thousands of you online ready to learn and work. The Mental Health Professional Network is truly taking a novel way to share wisdom with all of you and it's to be applauded. Working better together is the theme of this conference and it's a great opportunity to learn more about mental health in the military, about grief and loss and about trauma and adverse childhood experiences, all important topics that need our best attention and our best minds tackling these issues. We know the issues faced by our military and the risk to develop mental illness. We also know there are protective factors. This conference will bring together that conversation and work out how we best protect our serving people. Grief and loss affect all of us at different stages in our life. Understanding what drives that in people and how to best support them in their journey is really important. One of the frustrations for me at the National Mental Health Commission is seeing how stubbornly our incidence of mental health sits when we look at other non-communicable diseases. And what we know is that it is trauma and adverse childhood experiences that often lead people to a journey in the mental health system. If we can better address those experiences in childhood, prevent them, mitigate their impact, and try and understand trauma, we set so many people on a more positive journey through life. Thank you all for coming online to join the conference and to be part of these important conversations. I wish you every success. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Welcome, everybody, to the NHPN Grief, Loss, Older People and Mental Health Interdisciplinary Response webinar. Um, thank you to the 780 participants we have joining us online tonight and also to the participants joining us uh, later via the podcast. It's my pleasure to welcome you all um, to this and be part of this inaugural NHPN um, online conference which has had about 7,000 registrations, uh, or over 7,000 registrations of which this webinar is a part. I'd like to begin by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners on, of the land in which our webinar presenters and participants are located, and I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Hi, I'm Dr. Ebony Vandermeer, and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. Uh, I am a rural generalist based in Cooktown in far north Queensland and I have advanced skills in mental health. I work uh, mostly at the hospital but I work um, sort of between the general practice and, and primary care aspects of my community and also very closely with the mental health team and community services. Uh, and, and you know, grief and loss, particularly in older people, is something that I see every day. So I'm really excited to learn from our panel today and um, really, you know, get a deeper understanding of of what we, what we can do to help and, and what the best ways forward are. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, tonight's panel. First off, we've got Rob, Dr. Rod McKay, uh, who is a psychiatrist based in Western uh, New South Wales. And he, he's an older age psychiatrist and, and he has a passion, I guess, for uh, improving the mental health of, of people of all ages um, and stages in their life. He does a lot of education and teaching as well through the university, um, uh, the HETI, so Health Education and Training Institute, um, which is based in New South Wales, um, and uh, has a, a number of other hats that, so, uh, that he wears. So really excited to have you on board, Rod. How's the weather down there? It's pretty good down here. Other than nice doing food off. <laughs> okay. Hopefully not too windy then. Uh, pretty good. Good. Thanks, Rod. Um, next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Chris Hall, um, who is a psychologist based in Victoria. And he, for the past 23 years, has been really involved um, in, in grief and loss management and acts as the Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Centre for Grief and Bereavement. Um, and, you know, uh, has embedded his work life, um, his uh, CV is quite impressive, it embedded his work life in, in managing and helping and, and treating people with grief and loss. Um, you know, not too far away from um, Rod there, there, Chris, how's the weather where you are? It's not too bad, actually. It's been unseasonably warm, so I'm very happy to enjoy a bit of sunshine. 
Lovely, lovely. And last but not least, Dr. Kathy Andronis, who is a GP based in inner Melbourne. Um, Kathy has extensive experience in um, not only general practice, but also in family therapy, and also wears a number of hats with a number of different, different organisations, I guess bridging the link between general practice and psychiatry. She teaches medical students about, um, I guess, a patient-centred approach to consultations and patients, um, and she works with the Australian Psychological Medicine Society, the RFUGP, and the Australian College of Psychiatry. Welcome, Kathy. How's it where you are in inner city Melbourne? Same as it is for a rather beautiful day today. <laughs> lovely, lovely. Well, just in case you were wondering, it's really windy in Cooktown, um, but a balmy 25. Um, no quilts needed tonight. All right, so um, this webinar is designed uh, as part of the content stream around grief and loss, and it's one of the three content streams that the NHPN uh, online conference is running, uh, the overall conference being um, around the theme of working better together. The two other content streams are mental health and the military experience, and trauma, the impacts of adverse childhood experiences. This webinar, particularly tonight, will explore the relationships between grief, loss, and mental health in older people. So to access your chat box, which is very important during the webinar, um, there is an uh, open chat tab at the bottom of your screen. The chat box will open in a separate tab. Supporting resources, you can see down in the bottom corner of your uh, screen there, it has the slideshow, the ground rules, the case vignette, and any, any relevant resources um, provided to us by our panel. Um, and that's at the bottom of your screen on the, on the right-hand side there. If you have any technical difficulties, you can ask the technical support frequently asked questions to help with those issues. And we really encourage you to provide feedback um, at the end of the session. Uh, you'll get a exit survey, which we really encourage you to complete. So um, you would have had access to Carmen's story um, and uh, I guess the case vignette um, prior to this session and also the ground rules. But just in case you missed it, um, there will be a copy of the vignette in, in the supporting resources there. All right. So each, uh, the format for the remainder of the session will be that each panelist will um, provide their stories uh, their responses to the cases, and then we will open the floor to kind of a general discussion between our panels. There will be a bit of a poll where you guys, uh, as participants, will have an opportunity to, to let us know what you'd like the panel to talk about in a little bit more further detail, um, and then everyone will sort of sum up. So the, app, the learning outcomes for today um, are really to uh, delve into this case and to be able to describe the complex relationship between grief and loss, mental health and ageing, as well as the risk factors and warning signs for mental illness in older persons experiencing loss. Be able to describe the challenges, merits and opportunities in evidence-based approaches uh, for a patient like Carmen, um, and in treating and supporting uh, older people with mental health issues. And to better target referrals, for older people with mental health issues as a result of, you know, gaining a better understanding of the, the roles uh, that different uh, professionals play in across the different disciplines that we're talking about in relation to older people and mental health tonight. So as you would know, just a little bit of an overview about Carmen's story. So she's a 75-year-old woman and she's based in a small town um, in South Australia, uh, Panola. And she lost her husband, Robert, about 10 years ago. She has noticed that she's been consistently sad over this time. She feels a huge hole in her life. Um, but recently, with the news that her dog um, is, is unwell and may pass away, this grief is heightened. And she goes to see her GP, and her GP is worried about her. So, Kathy, can I ask you to take the floor and respond to Carmen's case? Thanks, Ebony. Um, uh, Carmen's story is a very common story in general practice. We see people who come in for routine things all the time, like flu injections, and we do notice what people are like. We've, we've known them for a long time. Um, often somebody like Carmen will have come over many years and we'll know quite a lot about her 
so we're, we're quite attuned to noticing small difference. Um, she will have appeared, you know, um, you know, for routine things in the past, but um, whenever lifestyle stresses come along, grief and losses are quite a common thing that we see. Um, GPs are likely to see people like her over many years, um, and GPs like to take a biopsychosocial approach to patients. So by that I mean that we will always be looking biologically and assessing her general health. I'll just get to the next slide there. Yes. Um, we, you know, and in the case of Carmen, we would basically think, okay, she's come into the flu injection, but we've noticed that she's not looking well. She's looking sad. She's lost a lot of weight. She doesn't seem to be the person that we remember her. We may not have much time on that occasion to um, spend with her to find out what's been happening, but we will try to have a general little conversation and our aim would probably be to see her again, to make a time to be available because it's clear that she needs to have a few things sorted out. Um, so taking a bio, biopsychosocial approach, we'd be looking at um, her general health. She's obviously lost a lot of weight. Um, we would always be looking at sort of preventative care issues with her. She's been generally well in the past. But when people have lost weight, it's quite possible that there will be a number of causes that need to be sorted out, um, including um, cognitive decline. Um, it's not uncommon for people to de um, present with depression-type sy um, symptoms when they're beginning to de um, decline cognitively. Um, psychologically, um, it seems like she's having a normal grief response, but Certainly depression needs to be ruled out here because it seems like there's been a big change from her previous functioning. And we're also thinking that um, um, because she's had a past history of having been depressed, postnatal depression after her second and third children, it's very likely that this could be um, a depression um, scenario here or more complex grief at least because um, it's been quite a long time since her husband died and there's been quite a significant deterioration over the last few years. She's clearly um, socially isolated, um, so that we really need to be making an assessment about how connected she is with the people around her. Um, the, the scenario paints her as being relatively isolated from her family and friends in Adelaide. But um, it's important to find out what she does do on a daily basis, who she sees, um, and to find out uh, what else is available in the community that she might be interested in. Uh, you know, we always have to be um, conscious that if we're living in a rural area, there may not be very many services. So there can be a mismatch between this idea that people in small communities all know each other and are sociable, and the reality that people still have busy lives. Uh, the RACGP has guidelines. Um, that were updated a few years ago um, on aged care, but the only one uh, that I'm aware of, uh, it's called the Silver Book, the RACGP Silver Book, and it's actually medical care of older people in residential aged care facilities. So there actually isn't particularly very much information about depression specifically for older people available for GPs. I mean, there is plenty of information about um, depression and mental illness but specifically for general um, for older patients, this seems to be you know something that we're not quite up to date with really. Um, in that silver book, there is a geriatric depression scale, so many GPs would, may find that interesting to see, uh, have a look at, and perhaps look at whether they need to ask more specific questions um, beyond a, a general screening test like the K10. So moving on, what to management, I, the GP would be listening to her and, and, and trying to maintain optimism, certainly giving her as much time as she needs. Um, social prescribing is something that um, is a, a thing that GPs do with, when they're not reaching for a, um, the script pad for a medication. And, and what we aim to do is to give the, um, the patient, the client, an opportunity to think beyond medication and to think about what else do they need to do. Um, we know that people who are isolated tend to see GPs much more. 
Um, there was a study done in Queensland just in the last few years in, out of Brisbane, and this has been reproduced many times within general practice, that people who are older and uh, isolated have more GP visits per annum than the general population um, when you match them for their age. And, and that's often a sign that they really don't have much to do um, and going to the doctor gives them an opportunity to have somebody to talk to. I mean, I sometimes see people who haven't spoken to anybody for two, three days, um, perhaps just to their dog or just to somebody in passing in a local shop. And GPs actually a quite important part of the social life of some elderly people, especially if they become um, depressed or anxious or lonely. Uh, and GPs can offer um, focused psychological strategies, just like um, other allied health under the Better Access System. And if a GP is able to do that, particularly if they're working in a rural or isolated region, or if the patient doesn't want to access other services because they have a long relationship with their GP or they only seem to want to um, deal with their GP at that time, um, going through her um, grief and her isolation and using CBT, looking at her perhaps guilt issues, the fact that she's blaming herself, um, just talking about grief with her and certainly scheduling activities, including positive activities for her, can be a really helpful way to help her. Um, I don't want to interrupt you, but we're at six minutes now. Just give you 30 seconds to sum up the rest. Okay. And basically what I would be doing is making sure that she continues to have ongoing care. I would consider prescribing from the SSRI, SNRI, metazapine group, perhaps even melatonin for sleep, but very much would be working with a team care approach with her um, and looking at who else can be involved in her care and does she need to be assessed by a psychologist and or a psychiatrist regarding her depression. And this is just a very brief list of grief counselling. As Thanks so much, by, Kathy. And um, um, you know, GP, I, I can I can feel the wealth of knowledge and experience process. that you have thank with you, these Stephanie. patients coming through in those slides. So thank you for summarising it so beautifully. Um, next, I'll invite uh, Mr. Chris Hall to the stage. Thanks, Ebony, um, and it's great to be with you all. I just want to start, I guess, with a, some fun fundamentals, and that's that grief is often defined as our emotional response to loss, and I think that's a very narrow perspective. Certainly, it has a strong emotional dimension to it. Um, clearly, it impacts upon um, our, our physical well-being, our health, depresses the immune system. Um, for many people, it's also a strong cognitive component. That need, people need to wrap their head around this experience of loss. There's a strong behavioural component where we see underactivity or sort of hyperactivity um, and a whole range of behaviours around, uh, particularly around avoidance. I think we often define grief in, in see very much an individual intrapsychic experience and it's important to recognise that, you know, it occurs in, in a social context. So families, communities will, um, are critically important. They will either enable or constrain the individual's experience of loss. And I think particularly somebody who is 10 years post the death of their partner, they may find that it's very difficult to access uh, social support. And finally, I think the dimension that's often overlooked is the spiritual or philosophical, the meaning that people wrap around this loss. Why did this happen to me? Um, uh, how do I integrate this experience with my system's belief? And in a sense, any one of those dimensions can present more markedly than others. But I think it's important that we provide a kind of a comprehensive assessment of, uh, of people's response to, to loss. And of course, when we're talking about grief, we can be talking about bereavement or adjusting to chronic illness, disability, relationship breakdown, etc. Um, so for me, it provides a unifying framework for, for lots of human conditions. So we know certainly that Carmen's experience is common. Um, by 65, over half of all women will have been widowed at least once, and by 85, over 80% 80 of all women um, are widowed. But I would argue that Carmen's response, the response is in fact not common. I'm kind of quite concerned that 10 years after the death of her partner, she says that she yearns for Robert on a daily basis and her life feels poorer with him, with him no longer in it, and that her grief feels little different from those first weeks a month without Robert. 
she finds herself crying, etc. So again, what we often see is an acute period of grief that everybody um, experiences following a loss. And for most people, that will resolve over time. But there's certainly a proportion in individual. And I think Captain Carmen belongs in that group who experience a kind of a chronic and unrelenting experience um, of separation distress. So we've got good data in terms of who benefits from bereavement intervention. And we know that for most bereaved individuals, probably around 90%, um, their uncomplicated grief is naturally self-limiting. Um, but we do know from a lot of the, uh, the review studies that there is a subgroup of mourners, perhaps around 9% of latest figures, who are at elevated risk for dysfunction and who resp respond well to more formal kinds of interventions. I think we can take a population, a public health model approach to, to bereavement care and recognise that at the bottom of this pyramid, most people with the support of family and friends, um, a good psychoeducation, information, um, is sufficient for most people to, to manage even profound and seismic experiences of loss with some resiliency. We know there's a middle group who may be at um, additional risk. Um, here we would include mothers following the death of a child, those who experienced sudden, unexpected or traumatic deaths. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, about 9% of bereaved individuals seem to go on and develop a more prolonged and chronic response to loss. Something derails what I would see as a very normal process of adjustment and accommodation to loss. This is often referred to as complicated grief, but more recently, following the ICD, prolonged grief disorder. And again, I want to be very careful here that we're talking about a significant minority of bereaved people here. Most people really don't require much sophisticated um, uh, in interventions. So we know that acute grief, the experience of loss, is, is virtually always painful and, and deeply disruptive. But we know that from a number of individuals, these symptoms persist. There's a lot of data that suggests that around six months post-death, which I know sounds terribly early, most people are talking about a kind of a qualitative and quantitative change in their experience of loss. Um, but th there is this particular group who, where these symptoms persist. And there are certain sorts of thoughtful behaviours or feelings that derail this process and gain a foothold in the mind and, 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 and prevent the, the, the kind of resolution um, of, of loss. In terms of assessment, of course we need to do a, a, a good and complete and comprehensive assessment of both the bereaved person, but also we need to know something about uh, the person who died. What was the nature of that relationship? In a sense, we kind of need to do a kind of a psychological resuscitation of the deceased um, and often to bring them into the room. And what was the nature of that attachment? What was the nature of that relationship that they'd lost? How people die is critically important. In this case, we've got somebody dying as a result of a cardiac arrest. Um, was she present at the time of death? Did she discover his, his body? Are there other um, traumatic elements as a result of the nature of this death? What was going on? We know there's a, a history of depression around uh, um, postnatal depression. Is this, is this different? How, what sort of strategies has she used in the past? What's her personality in terms of uh, the style she brings to this? We know that social support is critically important. Being surrounded by people that care for us is, is very important. And this becomes more of a challenge the, the further we move away from the, the point of, of, of the loss. And finally, all the concurrent secondary losses that people are dealing with, all the life change events, the, um, uh, the readjustment, the relearning of the world. So again, I think it's, it's good to access some good grief and bereavement specific um, tools such as social support um, and measures of, of meaning making. So again, we know that there are a number of uh, good evidence-informed interventions. We can talk about some of these uh, a little later and um, uh, look forward to exploring this topic further with you um, in our discussion. Thank you so much, Chris. A wealth of information there again. And good to see some uh, you know, literature around the evidence-based strategies for managing grief and loss. I'll hand over now to last, now to last but not least Dr. Rod McKay to give his perspective from a psychiatrist's uh, view. Thanks very much, Ebony. Um, 
I'm very conscious that um, just as we're talking, it's very likely that, that I'll be down the chain in actually seeing Carmen, and I think it's appropriate. But it does mean that as a psychiatrist, I think about actually how does Carmen get to me? Should she get to me? When will get, she get to me? And I think that's one of the challenges both in the community and particularly in the uh, general practice surgery is how to make those decisions. Um, and I can't help but picking up um, what Cathy um, said about the lack of information and education around uh, working with depression in older people. That is a passion for, for me. Um, and unfortunately, it, it is true there are limited things there. Uh, the Code of Psychiatrist Guidelines, which now actually include um, lifestyle as con extending the biopsychosocial approach, have got some notes um, that are worthwhile. Um, but I'd have to note also that um, maybe partly because I'm there at HETI, we do have some courses focusing on um, mental health care with older people. Back to Carmen. <sighs> Why will she or won't she come to see a psychiatrist or why won't the GP actually refer her I think is really important. Um, that's going to involve actually overcoming quite complex things that happen um, as they meet. There's going to be stigma, there's going to be fear, um, there may well be avoidance um, from Carmen or sometimes the GP and actually moving an awareness something isn't going right and actually having a discussion around it. And then there can be very practical things such as can Carmen afford to see a psychiatrist or a psychologist. So there's a real issue about actually getting the right information for both Carmen um, and the GP to be able to make a referral. And then how do you get the right information to the psychiatrist? So when I see Carmen, I don't have to ask all the same questions again. I can try and probe and um, understand Carmen and fill in the gaps. Um, so when should come and be referred is a really difficult question. If you refer too early, you really do risk pathologising what is you know, a normal process. Um, but if you wait too late, you can make it actually quite a lot more difficult for Carmen to overcome depression if depression is there. Um, and particularly if Carmen was male, but um, being female is only partially protective, you also have this prolonged depression increase that window where the risk of suicide um, can be increased. Um, but I guess the key issue there is the, in is the answer is going to be individual and it's going to depend on the strengths and the views of the person and the GP. Some GPs will work with Carmen really well, some will refer earlier, some would like to refer earlier but haven't got options to refer to. I think what's important in all of that is that we need, to, as the GPs, for all of us as health professionals and community, to have hope for Carmen that she will get better. And I think sometimes that is missing when we're working with older people. So when Carmen comes to me, I'm going to be thinking about what's been the pathway she's got to me, what, how's it going to impact on how she responds to me. The referral is really important. You know, I vividly remember an older lady, not so unlike Carmen who for a long time just said, what have I done wrong? What have I done wrong? And it wasn't that she was depressed. It was that her perception of coming to a psychiatrist was she's done something wrong. So a key part at the start is just overcoming that. Then it's going to be trying to understand Carmen, try and understand her problems, understand her, and do that biopsychosocial assessment without forgetting culture. Um, I guess for Carmen in particular, you know, what is the culture of actually living in a rural community with her family um, in a city? When I move then into thinking, actually trying to move that understanding of calm into a formulation of um, what might be happening, I'll be thinking about, is it prolonged grief in a sense that psychological responses are most important, or is it that it's moving into something where medication might assist as well. And remembering that even though um, major depression continues throughout life, actually minor depression, where there's not all the classic symptoms of major depression, can be just as um, disabling, increase the risk of suicide, reduce quality of life, just as much as major depression. So that sense of understanding, is there an enjoyment in life that she's having? Um, 
How does she see the future? Has she got a sense of meaning? Are probably just as important as actually whether she has a classic handful of major depression. What I want to understand as I'm doing that is though, are there factors that are going to guide my choice of treatment? If she has a lot of biological features, if her sleep pattern is particularly entrenched with early morning wakening, if she has constipation, um, I'm concerned about her weight loss if there's no physical cause, they would all indicate she's probably going to have require more assertive biological treatment than if she hasn't got those features. And then really where I'm going to from that is then to have a discussion with Carmen and normally recommendations back to her GP about what I think should be happening in terms of treatment rather than actually trying to take over treatment because really the GP has to stay at the centre of her care and the art for the psychiatrist I think is trying to support that and trying to empower Carmen to be involved in those discussions. Thank you. Great, thanks so much Rod. And thank you so much Cathy and uh, Chris for sharing your expertise in your different areas and giving us a really good overview of, of you know, what Carmen's journey might be like as she, she travels along this, um, this experience of grief and loss. So I do want to open the floor now to a, a bit of a panel discussion and I'd like to start with you Chris. I want to give um, you a little bit more of an opportunity to really give us an overview of the effective treatments for complicated grief um, and you know, talk to us about is supportive psychotherapy enough? Yeah, um, there, I think there are four strong contenders around evidence-informed interventions. One would be family-focused grief therapy um, developed by David Kassane in, uh, in Melbourne along with other colleagues, which is an intervention designed um, generally during the palliative phase at improving family communication. It, it draws very strongly um, from more th family therapy approaches. Um, the, the other would be the CBT approaches, and, and many of the uh, interventions, perhaps one of the, the best known ones, would be complicated grief therapy that's come out of uh, uh, the US, which is a structured, um, a manualized uh, intervention for people with um, uh, a complicated grief. I think the bottom line is that in these instances, grief is a trauma, and people avoid that trauma. And so often in our work with bereavement, it's about taking people to the most difficult part of their experience um, and, uh, and, in a sense, titrating exposure to that uh, particular um, experience. There are often particular things within CBT that we'd be focusing on, um, such as uh, self-blame, guilt, if only I should have... Um, there's also another approach which is more of a meaning-making or, or a constructivist approach which suggests that those who struggle the most in bereavement are those who are, are searching for but have not yet mapped, found some meaning in this experience. This experience is kind of unmetabolized. They've found no way of, of, of um, relearning the world and of operating in the world or the change in identity that often uh, inevitably comes following uh, bereavement. So I think uh, we see avoidance as a very significant component within complicated grief um, and also a reluctance to be out in the world to engage in, in activities and even um, uh, that, that, that derive pleasure. The evidence would suggest that in cases of, of prolonged grief disorder, supportive psychotherapy isn't enough. Um, and again, this is where a lot of these interventions are drawing more from some of the trauma interventions. Um, and that in the same way that we know that social support generally is in a, a powerful buffer, additional social support for people with uh, prolonged grief disorder is, is not enough. The other thing the data suggests is that these are individuals who are unlikely to spontaneously improve. Um, these are individuals who, um, when you speak to them eight or ten years later, they're, they're, uh, after the death, their grief still feels very raw and very fresh. And so it's, it's a really about the, the intensity and the duration of this distress, which seems to be important. Thanks, Chris. Definitely um, much more to unpack in, in there. Katya, I want to move on to you now. And, and just talking about uh, a little bit about accepting grief and loss as a normal part of sort of the management and, and uh, yeah, I guess, the response to a death or bereavement. And, 
uh, I guess that sense of wanting to avoid um, pathologizing people. Could you speak to that? Um, Ebony, uh, the older people are very reluctant to be diagnosed with um, mental illness. I mean, there's, I mean, obviously the stigma applies to everybody, but GPs are also reluctant to diagnose people, um, especially with grief, as having something more complex. It takes, you know, um, a long time actually to engage with patients, especially if they're older and they have mental health presentations, especially if they haven't had them in the past. Her um, postnatal depression was many, many years ago, so this GP will see her as somebody who's been pretty good and, and they haven't noticed anything. And now they've just noticed one year of her, um, or haven't seen her for nearly a year and she's lost weight. So GPs will clearly try to think of a biological thing that needs to be ruled out first because we have to keep people safe. We will be thinking about um, their social isolation and, and grief and because we see so much grief, so that pyramid that Chris talked about earlier, we're seeing so much of the people at the normal end of the period down at the bottom. And they really do just need somebody to talk to, somebody to um, put some perspective around their grief, somebody to give them a bit of a nudge, and somebody to give them good preventative health strategies so that they can feel good about themselves um, physically and therefore able to participate in life sort of socially. Um, we do probably, um, as GPs, um, become reluctant to talk about um, pathologising people, um, especially if they're older. But I think that's a two-way process. The patients, especially if they're older, really just don't have um, mental health language a lot of the time. Um, they're used to being... Um, fairly resilient or expected to be resilient, to being self-sufficient, um, and then not really up with um, a lot, as much digital sort of social media. And so as things have changed for Carmen, for instance, over the years, it's likely that she's just gone underground, which I think Chris mentioned as well, that people with more complex grief just can appear to be well. So often people won't notice but one thing that doesn't necessarily apply to Carmen but can apply to a lot of other people um, in a general practice setting, we are likely to know their families and, and are likely to hear from, from another relative or family member or even a friend or, or neighbour that, um, you know, or Carmen hasn't been herself usually. Or, um, so it's really up to us to slowly engage with her, not to rush her, She's going to be understandably reluctant to be diagnosed, let alone to go and see somebody. So we just need to spend time to re review her often. So I would say that um, because she's got biological things that need to be dealt with, that's a great opportunity to see her a number of times and to start off with this supportive work to find out, to build up her story. We really have very little story actually of yep. what's been happening. So we really need to slowly build that up and, and then work out what um, she thinks is happening to her, what's her understanding, um, how she thinks um, her grief is going, um, what thoughts she's had about could this be something else um, other than grief, we really slowly, slowly have to unpack this because the worst thing you can do um, with any patient, but especially with older people, is to rush to um, reach for the prescription pad or to um, send them off to see somebody because you've decided that they've got a mental health condition but they're not convinced yet. So you really have to be very patient-centred, very collaborative, and go slowly, um, unless, of course, you know, you've got red flags or, you know, suicidal intention or something where you have to rush her very quickly. It's important to go slowly and engage her. Thanks so much, Cathy. And I guess touching on and, and moving on to the next part of that, uh, Rod, I wanted to, to bring back a point that you mentioned about um, that the engagement sometimes is lower and you're on the back foot sometimes because patients feel like they've done something wrong by going to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. So I want you to tell me about how we could improve 
I guess our patients' perceptions and engagement in in being you know sent to a psychologist or psychiatrist, and what your thoughts are around that. I'm probably not the best expert because I see that people who GPs are successful in getting to see me, not those who they're not successful um, in getting to see me. Um, but the things I'll be thinking about, I think the first thing is is actually having hope for the person, and that if you maintain that sense of hope with your engagement. Um, the person's going to pick up on that hope and they're going to trust more that you're referring because you think it's going to help them, not because you're referring because you've lost hope for them or you don't know what to do. I think that's really important because um, there's one um, study that stands in my mind from Scandinavia about older people who died from suicide. And they mostly had told their GP and their family that they were thinking about suicide but the families and GPs didn't think something could actually be done. Um, so I think a key part is actually realising that most older people aren't depressed. So if they are, something's not going right. It may not be depression as an illness, but something isn't going right. And be on the front foot from the start rather than accepting it as being a normal part of ageing. So I think that hope is a key starting place. The next thing is I think just trying to slowly demystify what um, the mental health professional may be. It helps if you've got a personal relationship and you can say something about the person who you're going to be referring them to as a person as opposed to as actually as a professional. Um, and also if you can give them some sense of idea of actually what it might mean to see the person. Uh, I think one of the great fears people have, particularly older people, is that to see a mental health professional means they're at risk of actually going into hospital or being locked away. Um, and as a younger audience, that mightn't sound very likely, but it has been the experience of many older people or those around them. I think the other thing is trying to build up a network of people who actually do work with older people. I think that may be the most challenging because, unfortunately, um, GPs and psychiatrists are the main people in the health professions currently who have some training how to work with older people and depression or mental illness. Um, and I'll put grief counselling to the side there. Um, and, and that's a real problem that I think systemically we have to overcome. But as an individual, I think trying to build up those referral networks is really important. Yeah, thanks, Rod. And I do think, you know, I definitely agree that it's, it's how, often how you sell it. And so I wanted to bring you back into the conversation, Chris and, and Kathy, about that giving some light on your approaches to how you introduce that, that idea of being referred from the GP. And, and, you know, Chris, how would you want the GP to explain your role in their care, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, grief is a, is a um, idiosyncratic thing. You know, it is, um, and I think we need to look in terms of the support that we provide in an idiosyncratic way. Um, so if we can provide, as, and again, we're a special um, statewide specialist treatment service, but part of our view is that we need to create safe places for people to, to be with others. Um, and so we run a bereavement support group at a local pub um, it's called Men at the Bar. Um, guys come together, they talk about their experience together. It's kind of loosely supported and facilitated by member of staff. We've got walking groups where people walk together and talk. It strengthens that sense of, of, of connection. Similarly for children, opportunities to meet with other children. And they often say, I'm, you know, I thought I was the only one. And so I think there, there are a range of, of, of options. It's about um, supporting people to choose what works best for them, what is their safe place. And uh, I think going back to Kathy's earlier kind of excellent point, this all happens in the context of relationships, that unless we develop strong collaborative relationships with um, our clients or patients, um, then it, we can have the best programs in the world. Um, and often the difficult work um, needs to be done where there's an enormous amount of trust um, that somebody is going to be safe. So, you know, I think it's important also to recognize that a lot of good grief therapy is good grief education, to provide people with language, a way of understanding their experience, to normalize their experience. Um, and we know that people will kind of move, they'll, they'll need different things at different times as well. So, you know, empowering people, giving them choices, um, and uh, ensuring that 
they have an awareness that this, this grief will wash over them from time to time. It's not about getting people to let go or this idea that, that grief somehow disappears. You know, we continue to grieve a loss as we, as we live and as, as we change. Um, so I think some, some basic messages there about, you know, the nature of grief. You know, grief is the price we pay for love. It's unavoidable. We all experience it. Um, but giving people as many options um, as, as possible is always great. Thanks so much, Chris. I'm going to pause the discussion there, although, uh, you know, really great topics and, and, and vibrant discussion there. Thank you so much. To throw to our audience and open for a poll around uh, what, you know, we've got sort of 20 minutes, half an hour left. What would you like to discuss in more detail? What would you like to hear from, from our panellists? So that poll is open now. The topics that we have to discuss are the prevalence and impact of ageism, something we haven't talked about yet um, in, in great detail, but what does the impact of age have on, on presentations of grief and loss and the care that, that individuals receive? What is the overlap between grief and depression um, around this? And, and, you know, so where, where do those thin lines uh, meet and intersect? What is the difference between normal versus abnormal grief and how do you define that and, and, and how does that look over time? Uh, and then access and availability of allied health or aged care services, particularly in, I guess, regional and remote um, centres, but also in the city. You know, um, we, we heard from Rod before about whether you can or you, you can't get access to somebody who, who deals with older people. So I'll give you a few more seconds there just to uh, lodge your preference in regards to topic and then we'll, we'll open those questions up to the panel. All right, you can close the topic. Thank you, Redback. Well, we've got normal versus abnormal grief as the winner by 10. So uh, overlap between grief and depression also very highly rated. So we, we might spend the rest of the, the discussion exploring those two topics. So um, I'll open to you then, then Rod, um, or you know anyone in the panel actually, about the overlap between grief and depression. If you could talk a little bit more about how you differentiate the two there. I think that I, th I think the difficult differentiation is, is the first thing, and I think there's many approaches to it. Um, so I think in many ways Chris will give him a a better response about some of the the diagnostic patterns um, and the changes to DSM-5, which in some ways have blurred um, the differentiation between depression and grief. As a psychiatrist, uh, I, I think many psychiatrists often take a more functional approach. It is matching what symptoms are there. Um, in younger people, having a classic handful of major depressive symptoms makes it a bit easier. Um, but older people, depression often doesn't present that way, that way anyway. So I'm often looking for, are there some cardinal things that really make me feel the person is depressed, particularly a pervasiveness of either their mood or often in older people, it's actually their loss of enjoyment in life. And so I will try to explore that sense of, can they react to things they would normally enjoy? Can they say anything they can enjoy? I sometimes try to get them to project how they see things in the future, either asking that or ask them, what colour the future, the future is, and it was really interesting that some people um, actually have a little bit impaired, maybe from depression, and really have trouble with the question. Those who get the question and are depressed often you know, talk about black or move into a discussion about there's, there's no hope. So I'm looking for those features as much as I'm looking for things like is there associated with the depression, um, with the depression, um, changes in their sleep, changes in their appetite, constipation, but it's an overall picture. Um, and then it's a question, I think, for the person, what it means and actually what options they're willing to explore. Absolutely. Chris or Kathy, did you have anything to add? Uh, look, I, I agree with you, Rod, about, um, sorry, about the functional changes. Um, that's one of the things in general practice that I see a lot and it's a warning sign. Uh, people start to not cook as much, they start to um, dress differently, they may look a bit more unkempt. Um, it's really common to see that people are just not taking care of themselves. They get out to the shops less, um, they start missing meals, 
I mean, this is obviously perhaps what's been happening with Carmen. You know, she's lost 10 kilos. So looking at that, that um, functional decline in their way that they're living their everyday life, their ADL decline, that's what comes up as being really um, 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 something, a warning sign, particularly for older people. Chris, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, I, I think it is a challenge, and, and uh, as Rod mentioned, the, the most recent uh, edition of the DSM removed the bereavement exclusion, which meant that within, if you were bereaved within a period of two months, you couldn't be given a diagnosis of, of major depress depressive disorder, um, largely because there was no data to suggest that bereavement is any special kind of stressor. Um, but we certainly know that the loss of a loved one is a major uh, stressor. I, I guess in some of the things that um, I, I've heard from clients is that those who have a history, have had hit a depression in the past, will often talk about this being different. It's been, it, their kind of bereavement-related depression being somewhat di uh, different. What we see in prolonged grief disorder is this sort of intense yearning and longing for the, um, for the deceased. We often don't see that in major depressive disorders. Um, we often see um, interesting things, particularly as they related to the loved one. Um, we don't necessarily see that in depression. Um, we also see in, in prolonged grief disorder um, positive emotions are often experienced alongside more negative ones. Um, and again, uh, in major depressive disorder, the, the ability to experience you know, pleasure is compromised. I think we also see in complicated grief greater a guilt around the caregiver, self-blame. Um, and finally, we would see in prolonged grief disorder sort of the avoidance of certain places um, because they're reminders of the loss, whereas I think in major depressive disorder, you, you generally see a general withdrawal from activities and pe or people. Um, but yes, it is a, it is a challenge, um, and that certainly they can you know, um, uh, exist together. I mean, some suggestion about... Uh, about 15% of people with prolonged grief disorder would meet the criteria for a major depressive um, disorder in the first year. So um, I think we could do with better guidance um, around making some of those um, calls. Um, Chris, um, the, the issue of dementia is one of the things as a GP that I would be really concerned about a lot. And I'm always worried about um, when somebody has lost a lot of weight and seems to not be taking part in life very much, are they demented? And because that's such an important thing for us not to miss, we do get um, caught down that track um, with a patient like Carmen. She's lost 10 kilograms of weight. Um, we do have to um, go through all the biological things first, and that does take time. But hopefully, at the same time, we are talking to her about her social life and about her psychological well-being. But we really do need to be convinced that we've excluded those things before we can think about where we go to next. And um, it's very, very important to have her on board uh, when you start to present that scenario to her that perhaps there isn't um, it, there isn't anything biologically wrong with her that this is a complicated or uh, um, grief or a um, depression process and that the treatment is going to involve very specific um, things that perhaps she hasn't had to deal with in the past but yep. all very new to her. And Kathy, uh, I think. It... Sorry, Kathy. Uh, I think it's really important that um, I think there's a different way we treat those priorities in older people than younger people. Uh, if it's a younger person and we're worried they're depressed and something's going on medically, we treat both. Uh, I think the older person, there is so much stress on identifying um, dementia early that we forget that actually one early dementia is often associated with depression and that they benefit from treating from being treated. And the other thing actually is depression can mimic dementia. And I think often actually treatment for depression is delayed by, I think, a mutual fear of the person and the GP and the family uh, that dementia is going on. And no one wants to discuss that because of the sense of what we can't do for that. Whereas a discussion around depression or the other thing which we haven't discussed is, you know, that the possibility of substances, alcohol being the most common, or medication actually 
impacting on her. Those discussions where something can be done often get delayed. And I think that's one thing that really worries me, that the elderly get a different sort of um, treatment and they don't get referred for treatment. If you look at the stats for referral to psychologists or psychiatrists, uh, once you're over 65, you've got much, much less chance of actually getting access to somebody for specialist treatment. Once you're over 85, um, it's extremely rare. What are Absolutely. The things that Oh, go ahead, Kathy. Now, one of the things that's very different about older people being referred in, um, to other people is that finances are often a major consideration. Um, a lot of people um, who are older have perhaps also been used to being de um, managed in the um, public system, particularly if they're in a city and they're used to going to public outpatient um, departments. Um, a lot of those have really um, decreased their funding for psychological services with older people. Um, you really have to be really unwell now to be managed publicly with a mental illness. And, and the financial consideration for private practitioners is a really major issue for older people. And um, I don't know what it's like in where various people may be listening to this evening, but in in a Melbourne, there are not many people who will bulk bill um, who are psychologists or psychiatrists, and it's a big um, disincentive for people to want to go. Well, I think it's important though that actually, I think whatever their name may be in the different states, actually the specialist mental health services for older people in the different states, I think are an untapped resource. And I know New South Wales, they're actually under-referred to it. And people, they're looking more at complexity than absolute severity for the referrals. So I actually think um, you know, one of the options for Carmen, at least in getting advice and then possibly ongoing treatment, um, in much of Australia actually would be that specialist service. And as I said, mostly they're actually underutilised. I think it depends very much on where you are, really. Um, I, in, in Melbourne, I've had times when I've had months before I could get somebody assessed um, in the public system. Um, it's, and there is a lot more emphasis now with the changes to the aged care assessment to do biological assessments of people um, and to look at what sort of um, financial or um, home help support can be offered to them as part of a plan. So it has veered away from uh, from mental health in some, in, from the way that a lot of GPs see older people today. I think it does vary a lot from state to state, but I think it's worthwhile people knowing it is important that the age, the ACATs have changed quite markedly and they're really not a source of help in terms of assessment for depression in the way they used to be. If you're going to go public, you really do need to find your networks um, into the mental health type services rather than the aged care is the reality for most people. Chris, did you have anything else to add to that discussion? Well, I, I, I guess, again, I'm in Victoria and operate a service that's funded by the Department of Health. We see over a thousand very people a year and all our clinical services are free. Um, and, and so Victoria is in a kind of very fortunate position. And increasingly, we're actually seeing many older people using telehealth. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's really quite surprised us the number of people that are, that are willing to kind of use an iPad or a, a computer to connect with a, a, with a counsellor. It certainly is very difficult to access more specialist services um, more generally. I mean, we have a 1800 number and can refer people to practitioners and, and programs and services um, that we're aware of in other states. Um, but, you know, you know, availability is one thing. Actually getting people to engage with services is, is, is another challenge. And I think particularly with very complex experiences um, and particularly where there's a high level of distress and arousal and, and avoidance, um, it's, it's not always easy for people to navigate the service system and to find the sorts of supports that they uh, uh, that they want. And again, we'll often work with other uh, professionals, whether they're psychiatrists or drug and alcohol uh, counsellors, because people don't come with just one, you know, neatly packaged bereavement experience. It happens in the context of, you know, their their their, uh, their complex lives.
Yeah, thank you. And I, I guess, I, you know, I, ha I can't resist putting my two cents worth in. In far north Queensland, we have um, a visiting psychiatry service that visits from um, a bigger centre about four and a half hours away. And it's not an older, older age psychiatrist, although there is a service in that area um, that, that we can, the psychiatrist, the general psychiatrist can and do phone consults with. But there just isn't anything like that around. And if it's going to be a service that we refer a patient to, it's got to be telehealth usually. And then there's that technology barrier often. Sure. Um, and so I guess I'd be interested in, in hearing from the panel suggestions for clinicians out there that are trying to provide this care to, as best they can um, to their patients. How could they upskill? Where could they go? How could they find the people around that they can build as their network? Well, I mean, certainly from the, the grief and bereavement um, uh, perspective, there's a lot of data that people are, are generally relying on quite old models, whether it's Kubler Ross's 1969 Five Stages of Grief, um, and the field moved on um, a great deal. So again, there's some there's some good resources out there. Um, uh, grief counseling and grief therapy is probably one of the most popular books by William Warden that goes into is a great um, synthesizer of the research and provides a, a, a good Therapeutic framework for supporting people um, with with complex and 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 also more kind of acute experiences. Um, certainly, um, our website has lots of resources for both the general public and, and practitioners. So that's grief.org.au, um, and similarly, we've got a national toll-free number as well. Um, so there is a lot of um, material out there. Um, I think it's really important that um, if we're talking about you know, assessing depression, that we also look at some of the very good tools that are out there for assessing complicated grief and getting an idea of the level of, of, of distress and, uh, and difficulty. Um, but, you know, I appreciate people are, are time poor, um, but I think there are some really good, um, readily accessible frameworks that can help people perhaps develop a more nuanced understanding of, of the, bereaved, the bereaved client. Uh, I think Thank you. Very Oh, I'd like to add one point about um, how to get uh, more people to access um, services um, despite their reluctance. Uh, one, I've already alluded to the, the bulk billing issue and sort of the cost issue. It really is um, quite an impediment for a lot of older people. I mean, the majority of people who are aged are pensioners um, and don't really have a lot of money to spare. So I think that um, any um, allied health person who wanted to see more older people would have to be a bit more flexible about some fees. That's one point. And my second point is that older people um, often like to do things in groups or might, um, because in this situation they, she may want a social setting. It, um, there's a program that I'm aware of in my local community for people who have osteoarthritis of the hips and knees and um, they've been referred to a very simple group session, a uh, physiotherapy session, and they do very, very simple exercises. But in reality, what, and the pain improves dramatically even though they're doing very little exercise, but what's actually the difference is that they're connected to other people and they suddenly develop um, something to look forward to and they develop um, a community spirit around it. So that sort of makes me think that any group session that um, a psychologist or another allied health pro um, provider might want to provide around grief might be something that an older person might be interested in attending. Perhaps they might be a bit um, concerned about speaking to a stranger one-on-one, -on -one, but that's another way to try to get people to think about um, going to see somebody else. And what I, I think I, what I would add, I think what I'd add is that um, there are some resources you can access through Google. You've got to be very careful in terms of actually their origins, but um, there are some things put out by the professional colleges of psychiatry in Canada um, and UK as well as Australia that have got some useful resources. Um, and I, I, you know, I can't help but plug, it really is a gap in terms of access to courses and um, in HESI with the higher education to both non-medical and medical people it's a gap which we're really trying to fill with our distance courses, so there are some sources of 
either professional development or higher education if people want to go that little bit further in working with other people. Because unfortunately the reality is we, we do have very low levels of um, specialist training and small, small changes in practice can make a massive difference to the engagement or avoiding problems for the person and then actually see them get better. So um, uh, you know, I'd encourage everyone to have that hope and see that working with older people can be really be just so rewarding and just a little bit of extra knowledge can um, make all the difference. Great, thank you Rod um, and Kathy and Chris. That was a really engaging discussion and I, I learned a lot. So I'm going to give you the opportunity now just to have two minutes to really sum up, um, I guess, your thoughts from tonight and if you had anything else to add. I'll throw to you first, Cathy. Uh, my main thought really is to um, to go slowly, um, to, to expect that we, that we do have um, a, a problem with uh, managing older people. Um, they often have so many other um, problems in their life, usually biologically, and they are not used to uh, the counselling process. They're used to being more self-reliant. Um, and that we have to think a little bit more laterally about how we engage them and that we go slowly and, and always put it in a supportive um, framework and also always present to them the possibility that this is just something they can try. They, they have control. They, we, may, we need to maintain their autonomy and involve them in their management um, so that we're not really treating them as somebody who's dependent. Um, in my experience, older people want to stay as independent as possible for as long as possible. Great. Thank you, Cathy. Over to you, Chris. I think it's really important we do have a and take a non pathological view that, that you know grief is the price we pay for love it's unavoidable um, that we don't undermine people's resiliency and their own capacity to respond to uh, to loss with with their own resources um, that I think it's also important that we recognize that there is a significant minority of individuals where their grief does not resolve it still feels very fresh and raw and these are individuals we should um, um, work with in terms of exploring and I think exploring the nature of their story there's again um, the, the thing about a, a case study it's, it's, it's such a teaser really because um, there's so much detail and context that we're missing um, we're also seeing Kathy who's going to be experiencing another loss with the, the, the death of her uh, her uh, her animal which may in itself be a connection to um, previous losses so I think it's really important to take a kind of a rich history um, and of course change only happens in the context of, of a, a supportive collaborative relationship. Absolutely thank you Chris and last but not least Rod. I think you know, older people are great to work with um, they have so much richness and we have to draw out that richness um, we mustn't jump in too early we, we do know that older people receive too much medication and too much psychotropic medication but they actually respond just as well as younger people to talking therapy and medication therapy whether it's grief or depression as long as you do it well um, and we need to maintain hope for the older person. You know, young old age is the health, you know, mentally is the healthiest time of our life. Older old age is still a healthy time, but people are vulnerable. So I would agree with Kathy, go slow, but go and hold that hope for the person. Great, thank you. Thanks Kathy, thanks Chris, thanks Rod. So I think you'll agree, you know, tonight's been a fantastic discussion around the very, you know, essence of complexity around managing older persons with grief and loss. And uh, the, the things that come through to me is really that, that hope for the patient. Um, getting a really broad and holistic understanding of them as, as an individual and their context and, and applying that to the kind of treatment that's going to work for them. Um, you know, it's about aligning goals um, and, and really tuning in to, to that person's level. Um, some of the things that we talked about as well is that there's this uh, you know, emerging evidence base that can update and inform our practice around managing um, grief and loss for older people, um, but grief and loss um, more broadly that 
perhaps some of us will be interested in, in learning more about and there's some resources you know attached to this webinar which will you know you can look at, at later and, and further yourself and just uh, just a real sense of you know you can do this and, and it's a really exciting and lovely space to work in and that you can make a real difference to people's lives um, you know now and, and, and into the future. So thank you again uh, for joining us tonight. The next webinar stream uh, in this next webinar content in this stream is entitled Disenfranchised Grief, Exploring the Impact of Infertility on Mental Health, and it'll be broadcast as part of the MHPN conference, um, inaugural online conference, Working Better Together, on Wednesday the 5th of June, so I invite you to come along to that. Um, there's also a range of activities in the next two weeks, um, continuing exploration of grief and loss and mental health. Visit the MHPN website at mhpnconference.org.au to learn more. And I'd just like to thank Redback Conferencing for hosting us tonight on their uh, webinar platform. Just reminding you again that all of the supporting documents provided by your panellists are available um, down in that uh, corner box there on your platform in the resource library tab at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Uh, you will get a, a certificate of attendance within about six weeks from tonight for those who attended the live um, activity. And we encourage all participants on exiting to fill out the exit survey. Thanks, everyone, and good night. <laughs>